This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. A deserted Australian island. The ultimate adventure playground. When two strangers meet on a remote stretch of beach, they decide to climb a mountain together to see the legendary view. But when disaster strikes, paradise becomes a cruel and savage place. As one man faces a slow, agonizing death, his only hope is that a guy he hardly knows survives a deadly race for help. Anybody? What it takes to beat the odds on I Shouldn't Be Alive. Hinchinbrook, a mountainous, uninhabited island off the Queensland coast of Australia. Covered in a dense tropical rainforest and fringed with spectacular beaches, it's a magnet for hardcore hikers like Australian environmentalist Warren MacDonald. The best way to, for me to get rejuvenated or grounded, if you like, is to put a backpack on and go into the bush. I'd been hearing a lot over the years about Hinchinbrook Island and figured, you know, I should go and check it out. So it had always been on my map, if you like. Warren plans a solo trek of the island's only marked trail, the Coastal Circuit. Hinchinbrook receives few visitors. There's no electricity, no hotels. And the only way on and off it is by a ferry that only runs once a day. You could say, once you're there, you're nowhere. I don't go hiking usually to be with the crowd, so I took off on my own. This, a hike along the coast on a formed trail, walk in the park. After hiking a full day, Warren decides to make camp on a remote beach. Surprisingly, he finds someone already there. First thing I noticed is there's a guy sitting down on the beach wearing a bandana basically, sketching the scene out on the ocean. And I remember thinking, wow, that guy looks pretty chilled out, you know. Hey, how you going? Warren introduces himself to Geert hey. van Hoelen. Turns out he's from the Netherlands. Hiking to me is one of the things I really basically live for. And also being able to sketch and paint and draw, which is very important to me. The opportunity that I got for that on Hinchinbrook was just awesome, fantastic. The two immediately get on and talk well into the evening. Straight away there was a connection. Eventually, the conversation turns to the island's highest peak, Mount Bowen. What do you got there? It's uh, the trail notes. Some trail notes for uh, Mount Bowen. I was thinking uh, to climb it, you know. Right, take a look. Yeah, yeah, take a look. Uh. You know that uh, there's that book, A Thousand Things to Do Before You Die? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Apparently the view from the top of, uh, of Mount Bowen is uh, in there, twice. <laughs> How long do you reckon it would take to climb? I think a day, a day and a half. Maybe another to come down. Thoughts of continuing his coastal walk vanish from Warren's mind. It's a moment that will change his entire life. So we made a plan to get an early start in the morning. We figured it'd probably take eight hours to get to a high camp, and from there the next day we'd be able to make the summit and probably come all the way back down to the beach in that day. There is no clear path to the summit of Mount Bowen. Geert's trail notes suggest climbing the 3,700 feet to the top by following a creek bed to avoid hiking through the dense rainforest. We were going to be off track, but we still had something to follow. So navigation, supposedly, wasn't going to be an issue. Warren has the mountain in his sights, 
He's feeling great and moving well. I've got a pack on for the first time in six months and I'm bouncing like a gazelle from rock to rock. Unlike Warren, Geert just can't find his pace. And I had a real battle of getting on with. I remember thinking, what if I started here, you know, I mean, this is not a joke, this is serious walking. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, you alright? Yeah, no, no, fine, fine. Thank you, camera, thank you, camera. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, stupid. It came obvious to me that he was just fitter than I was, and I didn't like that much, that idea. But at the same time, I was having a great time. And I like that sort of element in hiking very much. Why should it be easy? I might as well stay home. Boulder hopping takes concentration. So much so, you can forget about other stuff, like where you are. We'd probably been going for five hours or so when I started thinking, wow, you know, we don't look like we're anywhere near where we need to be. Both of us realised that there's all these side creeks that we've missed. We've missed turn-offs, maybe we were on the wrong path. Doubt started creeping in. What do you reckon? I reckon we're in the wrong creek, but... I reckon you're right. The guys are now about 16 hours from the ferry. They've trekked nearly five miles through difficult terrain and are two-thirds the way up the 3,700-foot peak. I didn't feel like we were lost. I don't even know if I'd use the term geographically embarrassed. I just, for, to me, it wasn't a huge deal. We're going to lose the light, you know, soon. It's going to get dark. We'll pull up stumps here and spend the night on this slab, and we'll keep going from there. Come on, get. I think it was 7.30, and as it goes in the tropics, the dark sets in really quickly, and before you know it, you need a torch just to find your bearings. Geert may be a little apprehensive, but Warren remains high on the adventure. I had a pretty big sense of, wow, I'm back where I really love to be, you know, and that sense of remoteness. So I was feeling pretty good. But the call of the wild is soon replaced by the call of nature. So I need to take a leak, and the last thing that I want to do is do it in the creek. And you remember, we're out there hiking. This is our drinking water. So the rule is you want to get at least 50 metres away from the creek. So I decided that I'd climb up this embankment, and I made my way across the creek, feeling my way with my feet. I'm sort of tiptoeing across. The stones are covered in moss, and it's quite slippery. So I'm being pretty careful making my way across. Warren comes to the far bank of the creek, a low wall of granite. If I start feeling around on this rock wall, I know that there's a crack there and I'll be able to climb up it. And get my foot up onto the rock. This piece of granite has a long, a very long history. About 270 million years ago, it was molten lava buried deep inside the earth. As thousands of millennia passed, the lava cooled and solidified, and cracks formed within it. Then, as the mountains and volcanoes above eroded away, the cracks widened and deepened, leaving this boulder teetering on a knife edge. And at that point, I heard a huge crack. I didn't have a clue what had happened. Not a clue. Geek! Well, you all right? Well? Geek! Jesus, what happened? I could feel straight away that he was trapped, and judging by the size of the rock, I could not get that off. All I know is it's grinding down into my legs, and I just want it the hell off me. 
The weight of the boulder is crushing Warren's legs, and the resulting pressure building up in his veins and muscles is causing his blood supply to slow. If his blood doesn't start to properly circulate soon, Warren could lose his legs. I mean, at this point, it's, it's all about the pain. <laughs> It just it dominates everything else. So we, we just keep pushing at this thing for a couple of minutes. It's incredible the negative energy that the rock actually gave. It was almost as though the rock was pushing me back. Nothing happened, and it's like uh, trying to push a tank out of the way. I'm in a world of pain, but there's not a hell of a lot I can do about it. Geert clearly can't lift the rock alone. Warren, trying hard to focus through the pain, suggests what to do next. At some point, something kicks in, and I would almost describe it as some kind of primeval survival tactic where it becomes obvious what we need to do. And at this point, I start directing gear. Oh, look, get calm. Just stay calm. What we need to do, we need to build a lever. We've got to find a branch. Something we need to get a, a big branch. Follow me as quick as I can. Go quickly, gear. As if things aren't bad enough, the elements begin to turn. Bad news in an area prone to flash floods. So it started raining. I'm thinking, this is an idea. We don't really need this. The last thing we need right now is rain. I knew that something really serious was happening here and, I, and that I had to stay calm. I can hear him downstream wrestling with with trees and branches of trees trying to break off something decent that we can use as a, a lever and I, I can almost picture in my mind what he's doing and obviously I want him to come back as as quick as he can you know, I'm almost trying to will him to hurry up <laughs> I think I got it! I got it! I'm coming, boy! I'm coming, coming, man! This is the one! So Geert's beside me pushing. Okay! Ready? I'm pushing so hard now that I feel like I'm, I'm going to tear myself in half. And then all of a sudden it, it moves. Maybe an inch. You know, all it really did is we helped it settle further onto me. We need a tree. Yeah. Go get a tree. Okay. Okay. Get a good one. You're gonna be all right, mate. When he leaves, I start thinking the rain's getting harder and harder. You know, it's getting louder and louder. It's not a big deal until I realise I can feel water swirling around my hips. And it's coming up incredibly quick. It's not going to take too long for it to go over my head. If I thought I was in trouble before, now I'm really in trouble. The rain does not let up, and the creek continues to rise. There's a watermark high above Warren's head, an ominous warning. If the rain doesn't stop and Warren remains trapped, he will drown. With floodwaters rising, 
his companion is in a desperate hunt for something strong enough to move the rock. I would start to find young trees. I'd been given a Swiss army knife by someone. I decided to start cutting the wood, and sawing as it were. And in the process of doing that, the handles of the Swiss army knives, I, I pushed them off and not realized that the metal bits that kept the handles together had gone into my skin and tore the whole inside of my hand over. Geert's body is flooded with adrenaline. It triggers the release of chemicals which block the transmission of pain signals up the spinal column to his brain. I didn't even feel it. You know, you don't feel pain then. Geert carries his hard-won prize back to the boulder for one final attempt to lever it off Warren. Okay, on my count, get uh, one, one, come on, two, three, come on, come on, come on, come on. I think we're both waiting for that miracle of the old lady that lifts the car up off somebody trapped. Pushed to its limit, Geert's body goes into overdrive. The adrenaline coursing through him gives him superhuman strength. But ultimately, the boulder is just too heavy. We had just broken what would probably be the strongest lever we're going to find out here in a creek bed. And it had just cracked like that. And at that point, the, the fear factor definitely increased for me. I, I, I had this incredible image which will never leave me. I looked uh, in the rain and I saw his silhouette. And the silhouette got exaggerated by uh, the hood of the jacket that he was wearing. And I could see that his head was to, to one side. And I think... I think that I heard him moan. And I think that I heard him cry. That's the only time that I think that I heard any complaint. Then, a small break. The rain begins to let up. We're both totally exhausted, and it kind of snuck up on me that the rain had backed off. Maybe it's going to be OK. What do you think? I think I'd rather be in my sleeping bag. Sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have to be sorry about anything, mate. You did good. You did really good. The realization dawns on them that they've run out of options. Geert has to go get help. Up until that point, nobody wants to even contemplate the idea of him hiking out. And leaving me alone. Both men are experienced enough to know that making the descent in the dark is suicidal for Geert. He can't go anywhere until daybreak. The sun starts coming up and it's still it's the, the slowest sunrise I've ever seen. pretty bad at this stage. He looked incredibly white, pale. Geert makes Warren as comfortable as possible. He leaves a drinking cup, food and clothing, a notepad, and a few creature comforts. 
Give you something to do. You go easy, mate. It's gonna be another night, you know, before I get back to the ferry. I can do that. Another night I can do. See you soon. I'm in a position where I'm totally reliant on this guy that I've met the day before. Even as he's walking away, I'm calling out. Be careful. Absolutely take it easy. Go slow, walk in the bushes, whatever. You have to make it out. I'd probably set one foot in front of the other one and I already slipped. <laughs> I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm good. But I realized this must freak Warren out from here to no end, so uh, he saw it too. If you ever get slippery, just crawl. Just get down there, mate. Okay. Okay. It's going to be a tough trip. Geert's not a strong hiker and he can't get lost. He has to find the creek in time to meet the daily ferry. The boat has a radio. If he mistimes it, Warren will die. Everything is wet and high and the incredible, enormous amount of vegetation, leaves, plants, creepers, plants with edges that can cut your neck in two pieces, you, you go through it. I would descend really quickly, and I just fell over. Geert faces a terrible dilemma. He must get help for Warren fast. But if he moves too quickly, he risks falling and injuring himself. Trapped and alone, Warren faces up to his mortality. I'd always said that you know, it, uh, you know that there's some kind of uh, some kind of glamour, if you like, in you know dying out in the bush, you know, in a place that you love. And now I'm staring down the barrel of that, and it doesn't look that that pretty. Meanwhile, Geert presses on at a breakneck pace. Keep sharp, keep focused. Sometimes I'd hurry it a bit too much. And went down way too quick. I'm really angry with myself. You know, calm down, take it easy. Warren is not surfaced by someone who goes down like an idiot and kills himself. Just get down in one piece. That's important. Warren has spent nearly 20 hours trapped beneath the boulder. I found myself riding a roller coaster, is the best way to describe it, where at times I, I had to psych myself to such a point it's just like I'm gonna I'm getting through this you know, I can do it I'm coming out the other side to taking this nose dive down into the depths of despair in that that's it this is it they're gonna find you dead out here in a couple of days and I found that I, I that I rode that with each step Geert confronts new perils This is the Australian green tree ant. It does not sting, but bites painfully, expressing venom from its abdomen, irritating the bite wounds. These guys attack viciously in mass, causing pain like you've never known. No, 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 no. No. Ah. 
And all the all the ants came out and, and were all over me within a few seconds. I was covered in ants. And I saw a pool. And I just jumped in it with, with pack and all. The biggest thing to deal with, I think, was the fact that some of the best times in my life had been spent in the wilderness, and I'd spent time as an environmentalist protecting wild places, and the irony was that that same kind of place was now going to be the end of me. I found myself wanting to pick up the, the notebook that Gerd had left and, and to start writing a few things down, and I didn't realize it at first but then it dawned on me that in a sense I was writing my last words and wanting to record that for family and 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 people that I love and then I realized why Geert had had left it there with me I kept on descending falling down slipping Sliding, I had to get down in one piece, and that was what I was concentrating on. And um, at about six o'clock, a new rain shower started. Once again, it rained like an idiot. And where I thought Warren was, it was dark, black cloud. I'd been hallucinating. I felt nauseous. Couldn't keep anything down. It was probably hypothermic. And starting to feel sick like that was really a sign to me that I probably wouldn't last that much longer. Warren's body is shutting down. He is dying. I hadn't slept well, uh, I hardly had slept. I was really extremely tired. I started to lose it. And I lost the willpower to, to lift my feet up properly. Just didn't want, didn't want to walk anymore, I had enough. I couldn't care if I, uh, there were a few moments there that I couldn't have cared if I just dropped there and fall asleep. What the hell are you doing up here anyway in the first place? Back up the mountain, Warren is still hanging on, but he has a new problem. So it must be mid-morning that I notice in the pool of water around my right foot that there's this red cloud. And I'm, I'm thinking, what the hell's all that about? And it's a little late to, to start bleeding now. And I'm wondering what to make of it when I notice something moving in the water. And realised with horror, uh, it's a yabby, a freshwater crayfish. As if things hadn't been bizarre enough up to this point, this guy's nipping away at my foot. I, mean, I, I feel like now like I'm living in some kind of horror movie. Well, I grabbed a branch from behind me and just started spearing it, trying to take this guy out. Come on, get it up. What made it even worse was that I couldn't feel anything and that he could have been there for hours. He could have been there all day. It's been 35 hours since the boulder fell on Warren. Geert made it down off the mountain after the worst night of his life. 
But he still has 10 miles of dense rainforest to cross to reach the ferry and radio for help. Everything was sore. I was bleeding, wounds all over the place. That was just hell. I felt more tired by the second, by the minute. Geert is spent. He emerges exhausted from the jungle and back onto the coastal trail. I sat uh, on my knees and uh, started vomiting. Straight away dawned on me to keep going and not to sit down and start thinking. There was still no time for that. The next task was to make it to where the ferry departs from. Geert wills himself on to finish his life or death marathon, but then a terrible thought hits him. That I thought, which authority is going to believe me and how are they going to get a rescue party up here if I come along because they won't believe me. Despite his worries, at least Geert has made it in time to meet the ferry, and his fears are unfounded. The ferry captain, from the very second that he saw my eyes, he knew that some serious thing had happened. Yeah, copy that. Uh, just stand by. Mate, um, the rescue services are on their way. Thank you. They want you to wait on the beach. Warren is still with the living, but it's getting harder to hold it together. I noticed spots on my right foot and knew that wasn't a good sign. The thought crossed my mind that I would lose that foot and I thought, don't even go there. An hour passed. I looked to my bow and I just did not want to take my eyes off it anymore. Inside the chopper is Dr. Chip Jaffers, an American trauma specialist working with the Australian Search and Rescue Services. The doctor was very calm, looked at me and he said, hi, uh, we go up now and where do you think that we can find him? We had to make a guess that what we would take would be something adequate to lift the boulder off and perhaps uh, material to do an amputation if we couldn't get the boulder up. We weren't sure where we were going, uh, what we would find. Right about now, I've all but given up. You know, I'm convinced that something's happened to Geert and I'm basically just waiting to die. Geert struggles to get his bearings from the air. Your left there! To the left, go to the left! You copy that? That's where we went back! This is close! Helicopter's still one of my favourite sounds. I can see his arm! I can see his arm! He's okay! Now listen, we're gonna take you back to the beach. We're gonna drop you there, and we're gonna come get him. Okay? Okay! Right. And I felt 
felt really happy and warm. All my tiredness was gone for a few minutes. There is some kind of hope for me now. But I just felt so tired and so drained. I knew that I was nowhere near out of the danger zone yet. The medics dropped Geert back at the beach to wait for a second helicopter and head back up the mountain for Warren. I think we appreciated early on that because this is a very narrow ravine with trees hanging over it, there wasn't even a place to really bring the helicopter in and we were going to have to go down on wires. Even if you've had years of experience doing this, you don't approach a landing like that without fear and trepidation. I was at the end. I was at the end of the rope. And I start to slip in and out of consciousness. With that pure joy, if you like, that pure relief of not having to hold it all together alone anymore, comes this sense where I just want to lie back and not really give up. It's almost like surrendering that role to somebody else. This is the critical moment for survivors. Often, at the point of rescue, many, feeling a sense of relief, let down their guard, and then they die. I had the clear impression he was dead when I approached him under the boulder. I thought, this is really over with. Um, there's not much to be done. He says uh, something to the effect, uh, you know, Oh, I'm glad to see you. You know, then, okay, then I knew. I knew we were there. I knew we were going to be able to do something. How long you been here? Well, I know. I don't know. Now, are you allergic to any drugs? No. Nope. Take like anything you can give me. Okay. As Chip assesses Warren's medical condition, the second team arrived with hydraulic jacks and wooden blocks to lift the boulder. Now, we got some equipment to take the boulder. Keep the pressure on, otherwise you'll be losing fluid. Warren is in as much danger now as at any point in his ordeal. A deadly cocktail of toxins has formed in the blood-starved tissues of his legs. When the boulder is lifted, these toxins could flood out of his legs and poison his body. His blood pressure can crash and his vital organs fail. This is what's known as crush syndrome and it could easily kill him. I would say for the normal mortal man, I would have expected him to die, honestly. If not fairly immediately, perhaps when we were to remove the boulder. To combat the effects of crush syndrome, Chip injects Warren with a massive shot of adrenaline, hoping it will constrict his blood vessels and raise his blood pressure. Could have died at any moment, I believe. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. Oh! Ironically, it is the length of time that Warren has spent trapped beneath the boulder that saves him. The blood in his legs has clotted, stopping the poisons from spreading into the rest of his body. Ah! 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 Get out of me! Get out of me! Get out of me! Ah! Ah! Stay with me, no ah! Physically, he survived the rescue attempt, but, you know, from a physiologic point of view, the guy's still in profound shock. So his condition, quite obviously, was critical. The rescue team gets Warren off the mountain just as the sun begins to set. You know, that, uh, there's that book, A Thousand Things to Do Before You Die? Oh, yeah? Apparently the view from the top of, uh, of Mount Bowen is uh, in there, twice. <laughs> 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 
Warren was flown to Cairns Base Hospital, but his ordeal was far from over, as Geert was to learn a few days later when the two men spoke again by phone. I called the hospital in Cairns and I said, Warren, hi, how are you going? And he said, yeah, I'm fine, you know. Uh, I was a bit worried that you didn't make it out there, but you finally did it. Hey, hey, thanks, mate, thanks. And then he said, but I lost my legs, mate. And um, and I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. I'm sorry. I was so, so close to not making it. It wasn't funny. But I think it's changed me so much and allowed me to see things so differently. If I had a chance to change it again, I, I don't necessarily know that I would. Nothing has kept Warren McDonald from pushing himself to the limit. On February 9th, 2003, he became the first double above-the-knee amputee to reach the summit of Kilimanjaro, Africa's highest peak. Warren now lives in Vancouver, Canada, and travels the world as a motivational speaker. Geert now lives in Australia and returned to Hinchinbrook Island for the first time during the making of this film. Geert, Warren, and Chip remain friends to this day.